So before I begin today, are there uh, any questions on anything we've covered up to this point? Uh, basically anything that's relevant for project one. All right. So uh, today we're going to take a little bit of a break from uh, kind of hard implementation, systems the implementation uh, details, and we're going to back up a little bit uh, to uh, talk about some more abstract concepts. In particular, what we're going to talk about today is uh, data modeling. So we've talked about schema, and we've talked about uh, this idea that uh, organizing the data in some specific way or uh, giving the data structure uh, is one way to make, the, uh, make query processing over that data, uh, make updates over that data more efficient. But what we haven't talked about up to this point is where that schema comes from. I'm going to, you know, mentioned, mentioned it a little bit, but uh, we haven't really kind of gone down into the details of what a principled approach to designing a schema for a data set is. And so today we're going to talk about uh, something called the entity relation model that is an approach that you can take uh, to modeling data. Uh, the idea is basically, it is really quite simple. You model the world as a set of entities and you can draw these entities as little boxes. Entities have attributes and entities are related to other entities. So this essentially gives us a, a way of uh, diagramming uh, a schema for some complex uh, data set that we're looking to represent. And in addition to, uh, to providing us with uh, kind of a visualization of the data, it also helps us reason a little bit about uh, how different data is related and more importantly what kind of constraints we can place on that data. Uh, and these constraints are going to be super important because uh, based on certain types of constraints, we can make query evaluation over that data much more efficient. So today we're going to uh, focus mostly on just representing the data itself, and uh, next lecture on Monday we're going to delve into a little bit more of uh, how you build these constraints over that data. Okay, so let's start off. Um, the very foundation of the en entity relation model is an entity. So an entity represents a real world object or uh, thing or person or something in the real world uh, that is distinguishable from all other objects, people, places, or things. For example, a Starfleet officer would be an entity. A specific Starfleet officer would be an entity. Now an entity might have various properties, uh, attributes, uh, to use the, the term that we've been using. Now, a single entity isn't necessarily super interesting uh, because, well, there may be many very similar entities. And so the entity relation model has this notion of an entity set. And this roughly corresponds to the relations of relational algebra or uh, the tables of SQL. An entity set is a collection of similar entities. So many Starfleet officers, each of which have similar attributes and each uh, attribute has some uh, domain. In an entity set, to make things, uh, to make things efficient, we want to be able, or uh, to make things uh, understandable, we want some way of uniquely identifying a specific entity in that set. So in addition to, uh, in addition to a set of, excuse me, one or more of the attributes needs to be labeled as what we call a key. And that key basically says this attribute or this set of attributes is a way of uniquely identifying this particular entity. So for example, the officer's entity set might have uh, might include an attribute called OID, or the officer ID, and that o officer ID is unique for every single officer in that relation. Um, some other examples might be your UBIT. That's unique for each of you. 
Uh, a course code in a semester might be one way of identi uniquely identifying a course, such as this course, uh, which is CSE 562 in the spring, uh, uh, spring 2015 semester. Now, uh, in an entity relation uh, diagram, the entities themselves are represented by squares. The attributes are represented as circles or ovals connected to the, uh, to the rectangles. And we underline uh, the name of the attribute that is a key for that, uh, for that entity set. Any questions up to this point? All right. So entity is one half of entity relation. Uh, the other half is relations. So relations are, uh, sorry, relationships are associations between two or more entities. And these are represented as diamonds. So a relationship basically says, uh, here's one entity, here's another entity, and here is some uh, connection that we've established between those two entities. And similar, uh, similar to entities and entity sets, uh, relationships are also typically grouped into sets that have similar attributes. So for example, I might have uh, an officer's entity set and a planet entity set, and, my, uh, <clears throat> and I might have a relationship between those called visited that says this officer visited this planet, and uh, note that, note that uh, relationship sets can also have attributes. So there might be some uh, contextual information like when the officer visited the planet. Yeah. So the question is, how does this relate to SQL? Um, is our relations like primary foreign key relationships? Um, I will get to this in a little more detail in a couple of slides. Typically, when this gets mapped to relational algebra or SQL, both entity sets and relationship sets turn into relations in relational algebra. So um, an entity is one concrete thing, uh, and then a relationship sh set is a mapping between, uh, sorry, a relationship is a mapping between two concrete things, uh, but both of those would be represented as relational algebra tables or relational algebra relations. Um, how does this connect to uh, key, primary keys, uh, foreign keys? Every line essentially represents a foreign key relationship. Um, every underlined attribute is a primary key. I'll define the, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about here, I'll define these terms in either a bunch of slides later today or early uh, in tomorrow's lecture. But basically, the, for those of you familiar with the term primary key, foreign key, uh, every line represents a foreign key relationship. Every underlined um, Every underlined uh, attribute is a primary key, and sometimes you can represent uh, the visit, uh, a relationship as a single primary, uh, as a single foreign key reference. Don't worry about it. Okay, um, right. So, something to note is that relationships can also be um, can also relate an entity to itself, or uh, sorry, one uh, element of an entity set to another el element of the same entity set. Uh, so for example, I could have a, a commands relationship where the subordinate is connected to the officer that's commanding them. Now, this kind of relates to primary key, foreign key. Um, I'm going to use slightly different terminology initially because entity re the ER model has a slightly different way of uh, referring to this. <coughs> but there's a notion of key constraints. So depending on how these relationships are structured, the 
there may be different kinds of relationships. Uh, so as a simple example, uh, every subordinate is commanded by, might be commanded exact, by exactly one commander, but every commander might have many different subordinates. Um, a ship might have many crew, but the, uh, each crew member typically only has one ship. On the other hand, uh, an officer may have visited many planets, and a given planet may have been visited by many officers. So every single relation, there are many different types of relationships, and we typically uh, classify these in terms of one of the following categories. Either one-to-one, -one, where we're guaranteed that every single thing on the left-hand side is connected to at most one thing on the right-hand side. One-to-many, where the right-hand, uh, excuse me, the left-hand side uh, can have uh, multiple relation, or can be related to multiple things on the right-hand side, uh, or many to one, same thing, just flip it, uh, or many to many, where we don't have any constraints on how many uh, relationships any given entity has. Any questions up to this point? Okay, so we represent these in uh, entity relationship diagrams by the use of arrows. So an arrow uh, indicates that the entity on that side, excuse me, participates in at most one instance of that relationship. So for example, an officer serves on exactly one ship. We, so we put a little arrow there that says this officer serves on exactly one ship, or participates in exactly one instance of that relationship. A commander. Uh, every officer has exactly one commander. And I think I got that backwards. Um, every subordinate participates in exactly one instance of that relationship. Every subordinate participates in exactly one instance of that relationship. And we denote this, again, by an arrow. Okay, so there's another type of constraint that we can place on this. So we've, we've taught um, a key constraint indicates that a entity participates in at most one instance of that relationship. A participation constraint indicates that an entity participates in at least one instance of that relationship. So, for example, every... Um, what do we have? We might have a participation constraint... That bold really doesn't come through. Um, Every ship has to have at least one crew member. So we can bold the line between officers and the crew relation to indicate that the officer... Uh, sorry, every officer has to be on at least one ship. So we can bold that line to indicate that the officer... Uh, the officer-ship relation is mandatory. Right, so we denote these as bold lines. Here's a better uh, example. So there's also this notion of a, kind of related to this, is this notion of a weak entity. So a weak entity is one that has a, uh, that you can think of as uh, an element of a parent entity. So it's, it has a unique identifier, but that unique identifier has to be combined with the identifier of a parent entity. Uh, so for example, uh, 
So for example, a given commendation, uh, there might be a specific type of commendation, but the type of, uh, like a purple heart, for example, but the purple heart is irrelevant, uh, the, the, the purple heart commendation is uh, unique, uh, has to be uniquely identified by its owner. So Bob's purple heart would be a, uh, a unique identifier for a specific entity, whereas a purple heart is not a unique identifier. Okay. Is one other type of construct that we have in um, <coughs> ER diagrams uh, called? Oh, sorry. There's a couple of others. Um, so those are basic. These are basically the the um, simple constructs. Um, Ninety percent of it, uh, of any kind of structured design that you you will probably do uh, will involve at most. Uh, these these constructs. Bold lines to indicate mandatory participation, arrows to indicate uh, n no more than one instance of, uh, of, of uh, participation, entities, attributes, and relationships. Now there's a couple more uh, interesting constructs that you can use to represent more complex relationships or more complex structures. And one of these is called uh, an isa hierarchy, um, as in Bob is a person. So isa hierarchies define, uh, you can think of these kind of like class hierarchies. So a cargo ship is an instance of a ship. A uh, shuttlecraft is an instance of a ship. Ships have certain common attributes the, the isa instances also have their own specific attributes, but kind of like uh, child classes, the, uh, the cargo ship has a capacity. Not every single ship is going to have a capacity. Uh, a shuttlecraft might have a parent uh, a, a relationship to a parent ship, or might be uh, uh, on board a parent ship, uh, but not every single ship has a parent ship. So this is uh, quite useful when you want to define um, certain kinds of structure, uh, basically class hierarchies in your entities. Any questions up to this point? Yeah. No, uh, so this means that every shuttlecraft has at least one ship, and every shuttlecraft has at most one ship. So every shuttlecraft has exactly one parent ship. Does that answer? Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's, so uh, if the line wasn't bold, then every, sh uh, if the line between shuttlecraft and parent ship wasn't bold, then every shuttlecraft would have at most one parent ship, but some might not. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a weak entity, which means the shuttlecraft. Uh, so weak entities must have this kind of relationship um, because they're uniquely identified by their parent ship. Uh, the Enterprise's third shuttle, for example, or the uh, Enterprise's first shuttle, um, or the Defiance second shuttle. Um, that uniquely identifies a specific entity. Uh, if I just say the second shuttle, that doesn't uniquely capture that specific entity. But can a survive no, and in that case, uh, so a bold, a weak entity has to have uh, an exactly one relationship to its uh, parent. Uh, but hypothetically, if you got rid of that relationship, 
it would no longer be a weak entity, or it couldn't be a weak entity anymore, but you could restructure the diagram accordingly. Uh, one, uh, one sec. Uh, go ahead. So the, the question is, this maps very nicely to object relational models or uh, class hierarchies. Uh, how does this relate to relational algebra? <coughs> uh, <coughs> so the entity, uh, the entity relationship model is, doesn't have a direct one-to-one -one mapping with relational algebra and the relational model. Um, the reason for that is that the entity relation model actually, well, so it's a, a bit, quite a bit more powerful. And the reason for that is that you need that expressive power to capture, to capture many real world constructs that you'd want to capture. However, kind of like the relationship between SQL and relational algebra, this is much more expressive, but it's much harder to optimize around. So the relational model gives you a much more, uh, gives, you, gives you something that you can optimize around more efficiently. Uh, but uh, so for example, an is a relationship. Uh, I could instantiate this in the relational model in a couple of different ways. So I could have, um, I could have uh, a, uh, a single relation for all of the ships with an extra column for capacity and an extra column for parent ship. And if the ship type were a cargo ship, then capacity would be filled in, but I'd have a null for uh, shuttlecraft. So that's one specific way to realize this entity relationship diagram in a relational uh, database. But it, there are many others. I could have some kind of weird foreign key relationship. I could uh, actually have a separate uh, instance for cargo ships and a separate instance for shuttlecraft and a view defined uh, over for all ships. I could, I could represent this in a bajillion different ways. Uh, but the point is that uh, this gives me a much more concrete idea of what I'm trying to represent, whereas the relational representation is kind of the, the more concrete instantiation uh, that you actually can perform queries over. Um, my goal today is basically to, tell, uh, to give you guys an, uh, the goal of the entity relationship model is to give you a principled way to express what you want to encode so that when you actually start trying to encode it, you have a more clear picture of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Does that address? Uh, did you have a? No. A weak, uh, so the question is, is it possible for two weak entities to be related to one another? Uh, the answer is no. Um, there has to be a strong entity uh, connected to the relationship in order to, uh, to provide a unique identifier. Um, to expand on that slightly, if you have, uh, it's possible for three entities to be related to one another. Um, they're very weird. I think I have a slide on that in a little bit, but uh, two of those could be weak entities. But, yeah. Uh, yeah? Uh, so every, so the question is, uh, every, if every shuttlecraft has to have a parent ship, um, can we deduce a relationship that every cargo ship must have a shuttlecraft? Um, 
so every shuttlecraft has to have a parent ship, but that relationship isn't bidirectional. So uh, the ship's side of this, this the, the line between ships and parent ship uh, isn't bolded. So parent ships don't have to have a shuttle, or a parent ship doesn't have to have a shuttlecraft. So a cargo ship m can have a shuttlecraft, but a cargo ship doesn't have to have a shuttlecraft. Does that address your question? All right. Now, um, to make things even more interesting, uh, there's a notion called aggregation. Now, this isn't aggregation in the, the SQL sense. This isn't uh, sum or count or whatever. Um, but there's, there's some cases where you might want to relate one entity to an entire set, of, uh, to, to a, relation, it's, uh, a relationship. So for example, um, officers, I, I may have this uh, relationship between officers and planet visited, um, and that visited relationship might involve some sort of transportation. So if the officer visited a planet, they got there using one or more ships. We represent this by drawing a box around the thing that we want to uh, aggregate and treating that entire box as an entity set. So this entity set is essentially, uh, you can think of this kind of like a, a ternary relationship, except it allows one-to-many relationships. Uh, what do I mean by that? So if an officer took, uh, let's say, the Enterprise and the Defiant to visit uh, Earth, then there's a single relationship, officer visited Earth on uh, February 1st. There's one relationship, but they took two ships to get there. So this is a one-to-many relationship between the, uh, the visited relation and the ships. And this allows us to do, uh, this, this uh, aggregation allows us to do that. Okay. So I went into this uh, uh, a little bit already. An ER diagram is, is there for one simple purpose. It's there to help you uh, try and put on paper what it is that you're trying to model. When you're building a schema, when you're trying to design a database, um, before you even start creating tables, creating relations, you want to know what it is that you're trying to model. And an ER diagram is a way to do that. And while you're doing that, the ER, ER diagram essentially forces you to um, make a couple of upfront decisions. Like, uh, for example, <coughs> excuse me, uh, should a concept be modeled as an entity or as an attribute? Um, I have uh, I have two cats. That probably means that my cats should be an entity because they are there are multiple. Uh, instances of them, I want a relationship, uh, a one-to-many relationship. I have one laptop. Maybe the, the laptop is something that I can model as an attribute rather than as an entity. There are many cases where a concept might be a relationship. Is my, uh, the, the concept of a job. So I have a job. Uh, is that a relationship between me and the university or is that a entity in and of itself? What kind of relationships do we want to model? Let's go through a couple of examples. So where is an officer currently located? I could represent that as a 
uh, an attribute of the officer, but I may want more information. I may want uh, other connections. So what I could do is model the, the set of possible locations as planets and model the location as a relationship between officers and this planet's entity set. And which of these we use is really going to depend on what we're trying to do with the data. If we're going to be asking a lot of questions about the planets themselves or the locations, maybe we want to model this as planets in, using the planets approach. Um, can an officer have multiple locations? If that's the case, well, you know, this weird uh, time travel craziness. Uh, maybe we actually want to model uh, the planets as entities. So there's a couple of different options here. Uh, right. So here's an example of kind of this, this problem. So an officer might have a relationship. So every relationship between two entities is has relationships are are uh, we we talked about them as sets. And that create some weird situations. What do I mean by that? So every officer and every planet might be related in some way. Bob might have visited Earth at some time. Now, relationships can have a from and a to attribute. And so Bob visited Earth from uh, February to March. But now if I want to create a new relationship, if Bob visits Earth multiple times, that means we need to create, uh, that means that Bob now has multiple relationships between a given uh, planet. So this is an example of where we'd want to have multiple relationships. Oh, sorry, uh, this is an example of where we might want to use um, ternary relationships uh, in order to give us the ability to have multiple visits. So if I were to, uh, if I were to represent uh, this using a ternary relationship, so um, officer located planet and then add a duration attribute, that duration, uh, sorry, a duration entity, that duration entity uh, allows us to create multiple instances of this one relationship. So officers can be located on a given planet over a period of time. And I can they can be located on the same planet over different periods of time. Okay. All right. So that's a whole bunch of craziness. Um, let's do a quick little bit of group work to finish up here. Once you turn to your neighbor and um, so here's a really quick entity relationship diagram. Um, and we want to, right now, the way it's set up is that every single uh, department is managed by some employee. And the department has a discretionary budget for 
uh, any kind of whatever expenditures the, the department might have. Now, now let's say that there's some restructuring going on here and we want to change the way that the budgets are allocated so that rather than allocating budgets per department, we allocate them per manager. Or sorry, uh, yeah, per manager. How would we represent, uh, so turn to your neighbors and uh, we'll, and take maybe two to three minutes uh, and figure out how you would uh, rewrite this entity relationship diagram uh, so that the budgets were um, set up per manager rather than per department. And we'll talk about that in three minutes. All right, any thoughts? Let's start with the diagram as we have it. So we've got employee uh, with relationship. with a department ID uh, and a name. Oops, not an ID. 
All right. Yeah. So we can create user relationship and use the sub entity manager with the two attributes manager ID and project ID. All right. So uh, manager. do manager and this has a budget and this is an instance of an employee uh, and then oh uh, so it is a relationship uh, it inherits the identifier of so the social security number continues. Uh, and what else? OK. Uh, can we reuse this one? All right, so now only managers can manage a department. Uh, I think that the should be like manager would get weekend duty. Uh, uh, is, uh, is so uh, manager would be a weak entity with respect to department or with oh, sorry. every department has to have a manager um, oh it has at most one manager uh, this you mean like this So every manager has at least one department, and every department has at least one manager. All right. All right. Sorry. Other way around. Uh, this is every manager has at most one department. I think you're, uh, were what was what you you were looking for bold? Yeah. Okay. So every manager has at least one department, and every department sorry at most. Every manager has at least one department, and every department has at most one manager. All right, great. Um, all right, let's. All right, maybe let's uh, kind of start hinting at next. Uh, the next lecture. So just to wrap up, ER, the ER model uh, is basically a way uh, to put down your vision of how the, the world that you're trying to model in the database works. It's more expressive than the relational model, uh, so you're, you're going to have to take another step to actually figure out how to represent it. But it's a great way to approach the first step of just putting everything down on paper uh, to, to try and understand what it is that you're trying to model in the first place. Starts with an entity's relationships and, uh, and sets of both, and then builds kind of a couple of different uh, constructs on top of that. Weak entities is a hierarchy's aggregation. And as we've easily discovered, uh, there's no one right way to model a given uh, scenario, but this is a way to kind of figure out what's important uh, for your particular setting. It's a way for you to think through the process of uh, representing everything. And I mean, this is a talking to people who, uh, to DBAs, talking to basically anyone who uh, works with databases. Designing the schema for a given problem is a multi-week project. Uh, usually like two or three people are going to spend uh, at least a week and often close to a month just hashing everything out and getting the relational uh, representation or getting the, the model correct uh, so that they can be both efficient and uh, make it easy for analysts to, to uh, ask, access the data. So this, this is an important step in the process. OK, so we talked about um, modeling data. And we talked about a couple of different types of constraints. Uh, 
Um, uh, we've talked about uh, participation constraints and key constraints. Now let's uh, kind of broaden that a little bit and ask ourselves what kind of other constraints can we place on the data, uh, both to make sure that what uh, that when we're working with the data, we, we know it's correct, as well as uh, kind of ways of uh, helping the database to understand what kind of constraints it has to work with when optimizing your queries. So there's a notion uh, called integrity constraints that you, uh, that you can place on um, kind of any, actually, let me back up. Uh, so now we talked about the, the ER model. Now we're going to jump over to the relational side of things and uh, talk about how we can uh, define these constraints in the relational model. Uh, and I'm just going to tease at this a little bit uh, because we have about two minutes. Um, Integrity constraints are basically ways of telling the database what it means for a data value to be correct, or what it means for a table to be correct. And this serves two purposes. Number one, it prevents you from doing something that breaks that assumption. Um, if you try and insert a data value that violates an integrity, integrity constraint, the database won't let you. So this is a safety mechanism for one. The other advantage of an integrity constraint is that in most cases, uh, the database will be able to take advantage of these integrity constraints to uh, make query evaluation or make updates more efficient as well. So these are typically uh, simple predicates over the data. Um, there must be a relationship between, uh, there must, uh, participation relationships um, are a good example. And all of this gets used. We're going to talk next lecture about uh, domain constraints, which uh, restrict the values that a variable can take. Uh, we're going to talk about key constraints, which limit the set or the uh, limit, uh, give us ways of asserting the uniqueness of tuples in a relation. Uh, we're going to talk about foreign key constraints, which are relationships between two different uh, tables in a database, two different relation, uh, relations in a database. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, table constraints, which are basically just kind of catch-all terms uh, for any kind of property that we want a table uh, or relation to satisfy. Uh, so with that, any final questions? <laughs>